Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays of the month. The first Sunday of the month, I do a subscriber Sunday video where subscribers send in garden photos that they're proud of. Um, the email address to send those is right here. Uh, just title those uh, emails subscriber photos or something like that if you're interested in participating in that. I collect the, the photos for all of February and those will go up the first Sunday in March. Uh, I think I have one more question and answer video after this one uh, next Sunday. If you have gardening questions, you can ask them down below and I pick from those. And I try to pick different ones. Apparently last week um, I, I did one that I had done recently, um, but sometimes I have a hard time remembering what I've said or not said uh, on, on the camera because I may have answered it you know, to somebody else you know, in person or whatever. But I try uh, to, to have some, some sort of unique uh, questions uh, on a week-to-week -week basis. Those of you who have um, uh, experienced all the cold uh, out in uh, Oklahoma and Texas, obviously it was cold through the entire Midwest, but those who have ex had cold beyond where it is normally that cold, um, you know, the zeros and things that we saw down there, um, um, you know, I feel for you. I have done, um, had lots of... Uh, experienced lots of cold damage uh, on plants uh, over the years and uh, um, in the nursery business. And I grew a lot of trade gallon plants, really small things that I sold to other nurseries and they were particularly vulnerable, uh, you know, for, for winter damage. Uh, if, if you want, um, a few of you guys in uh, Texas and Oklahoma and those places can send some photos to that same email address of, your, of some plants and uh, uh, maybe, um, you know, I can make some suggestions uh, on how to uh, go about pruning them or, or whatever. Pro probably as a general rule of thumb, I'm not going to prune anything that looks uh, badly damaged at all. I'm just going to wait for them to start to leaf back out. Holly, Holly, Holly's over here behind the camera thinking about eating something. Holly, no ma'am. Uh, if you have something, uh, wait until they start to leaf back out um, if they're alive. Uh, and then cut them down to that level. So just wait for that to show itself where it's going to, where it's dead to. Because some part of the top of the plant, if it looks badly damaged, probably is dead. But you don't know how far back on the wood that is until they start to leaf back out. Once they do, you can prune them at that point. Uh, things that were planted late, you know, things that were planted October, November, December, and then experienced this kind of cold in January and February, probably not going to go well for those plants. Um, I'm, you know, hate to be the bearer of bad news on things like that, but probably are going to, that's going to go pretty poorly. You can look down at the bottom of the plants and see if you see any cracking right at the, right where they enter the ground. Uh, if you see that kind of cracking, usually that's not a very good sign either. That means that the freeze thaw of the water that was left in the plant, you know, can pop the bottom of the plant. That would be something I would look for uh, when I'm uh, examining, you know, plants, but when, when I was examining plants at my nursery as to whether or not they were actually dead or, or not. Uh, sometimes those things can stay green on the top, um, but never grow anymore. And they stay green for a long period of time and I would keep stuff and I would keep stuff. But if they had that crack down at the bottom, um, usually they were trash. But um, again, send, send, you know, send me some photos if you want to, and uh, maybe we can try to figure out, um, you know, Maybe I can help salvage a few things here or there. I'd love to help. Okay, next uh, thing up on the list for questions. Uh, somebody asked me how far from a foundation they could plant a Tokyo Tower um, fringe tree. I put up a video a couple days ago on um, my favorite uh, uh, flowering trees and fringe tree was on the list. There's a native fringe tree and then there's a Chinese fringe tree, Cyanthus retusus. Tokyo Tower is a vestigiate or upright uh, Cyanthus retusus or Chinese fringe tree. Keep in mind that tree is actually grafted to a regular fringe tree. So the top of the tree is vestigiate, but it's actually grafted to another tree. So the roots are going to be, you know, still, you know, have a fairly substantial root system under it. I don't think it's the type of root system that would damage your house, but do keep in mind there's going to be significant roots under that tree. But the the width of the tree is going to be pretty narrow, so about five or six feet if, you, if you're determined to put one up by your house would probably be fine because it is very upright and narrow. Great tree. A friend of mine does most of the grafting on them. I've got one right here in the backyard that I didn't show in that video a couple days ago because it's about a three foot tall stick <laughs> right this minute. It's, uh, maybe this year it'll, look, uh, it'll start to fill out some. Somebody asked me about attracting earthworms um, to uh, the yard and uh, you know how to go about that whether they should just buy earthworms to add. You could buy them if you wanted to, but here in this yard, 
Uh, it's just absolutely full of worms. And all I did was about this time last year, you guys saw, I composted this entire yard and then um, I put down wood chips on this entire yard. And since then I've remulched one other time and uh, it's just absolutely full of worms. It didn't take that long uh, to, uh, to reestablish them. It may take longer depending on your soil type or where you're starting from or, you know, that kind of thing, how much damage it, you know, there was, there was no construction in this yard for 80 years. And so, you know, this is a, an old house. And so, uh, you know, if it's brand new construction and they just absolutely stripped everything, it may take a little while longer, but it's just really a matter of just throwing organic material at it, compost and mulch and uh, organic fertilizers and, you know, that kind of thing. Just don't do anything that's counterproductive to drawing them into the yard, like tilling all the time or something like that. Um, th and they'll be there. Yeah, you know, they'll be there in time. Okay, um, somebody asked me how to detect root rot on azaleas. Typically when you see azaleas start to get root rot, you'll see one branch at the time just kind of turn black. You'll see the same thing on a kuba. You'll see the same thing on pretty much any plant that's dying that way from root rot. Uh, even Japanese hollies will do that. Just one branch at the time will start dying. Um, and then how to save them, you know, you have to cut that brown part out and then you probably would want to raise them up or even move them. If it's Phytophthora root rot, if it's a disease, likely the plant's just going to die and just maybe slowly one branch at the time. But uh, if it's not Phytophthora uh, and it's just, uh, if it's just from them sitting in water but no disease has actually entered the picture, uh, then um, you, know, you, can ra you can still raise them up. If you've got plants that you think are in too wet of an area and they're n fairly newly planted, you don't have to just sit there and watch them die. You can go out and move them. Um, you know, you can move anything really if you try hard, you know, with enough work. Uh, but you can, you know, go back and raise them up some. If you think they're vulnerable in the space that they're sitting in, if you see water, you know, pooling in that area um, and that kind of thing. We've had a tremendous amount of uh, rain in our area and I had com I'm not complaining about it at all. I would have rather had this rain in milder temperatures, although it's like 24 uh, right this second. Um, but we've had much milder conditions than you guys had over there on the other side of Appalachians, but we've got all the rain that that jet stream dove down and then got the water out of the Gulf and has been drowning us in, uh, in, in rain. Again, I'm not complaining about that at all um, because all my plants I planted up high and prepared, are they're well prepared for this type of rain that I'm experiencing. So um, uh, I'm not complaining uh, compared to what you guys are going through or have gone through. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked me if the drip irrigation timer that I had used uh, in old videos, would I still recommend it? Yes, that was an Orbitz timer uh, that I had um, in the old drip irrigation videos. If you only need to hook up one, you know, one line of drip hose. When I went to buy one, I could put three lines on and have a water hose. So it had four connections on the drip timer. Uh, I couldn't find that an Orbitz one to do that. So I got a different brand and that different brand one is linked in my Amazon store below all of my uh, videos and it's worked well so far. Um, so no complaints about it, but I'm not currently using the one I was from that video, but I would highly recommend the one from that video. That Orbitz one's a built like a tank. Um, uh, it la it's just lasted and lasted. I still have it in the shop over there. Uh, somebody, uh, okay. So I had said I don't use potting soil you know, when I'm planting and planting holes, you know, if you go back and look at my clay planting video, which has a half a million views or something, um, I talked about not using potting soil because in clay soils, cause it can definitely um, uh, end up holding too much water. It just, I mean, it's a, you know, peat moss just wicks water from, you know, as much as it can, it dr drinks water. Um, and they wanted to know if I would, you know, if they should dispose of their old potting soil from their, you know, when they have containers at the end of the season and not use it in the yard. I actually use my, I'll dump my containers in the vegetable garden over there or I'll dump them in the compost bin in a second. I'm just talking about not putting in a, you know, putting it into the holes, you know, the planting holes that I'm using in clay soils. But top dressing with the old potting soil you have, heck yeah, um, any organic material you want to add to it, as long as the plants in the pot container were not diseased. Okay, if that something, if something died in that container suspiciously, <laughs> you may want to dispose of that potting soil a different way or run it through your compost at least. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody asked me about a plant for 
hedging in a shady area or screening plants in a shady area in zone 8A, something that might get 10 to 15 feet tall. And uh, I would definitely put Elysium on that list. I've got three, I've got videos for Elysium on the channel. I've got Elysium, um, regular Elysium Floridanum over there. I've got Florida Sunshine Elysium. Probably, that's probably not a good one for you for screening because it'll only get about six or eight feet tall. And then I've got Miss Scarlet Elysium over here that I don't know if I even have a video for on the channel, but I've got three different Elysiums in this yard. Great choices for screening in the shade in zone 8A. Camellia japonicas will definitely work, but they're slow growing, so you'd want to buy something that already has some size on it, and that could cost you some money. But good screening choice for you in 8A. Um, Carolina cherry laurels came to my mind, and um, skip laurels as well, so upright laurels. Uh, cherry laurels are probably underused, the Carolina cherry laurels. And then plum use uh, also. There's a, a, a mood ring of uh, podocarpus here uh, that could be used, and then uh, 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 any upright podocarpus, so Mackie podocarpus um, would also work. Okay, somebody asked me if I'm still doing a fertilizer video. Yes, I've got fertilizer in the mail the other day. I'm gonna put it out tomorrow. Um, I may get that video up uh, as early as tomorrow, which is just Jim throwing some fertilizer on some plants. It's not going to be <laughs> special or unique, but generally I will talk about why I'm using organic fertilizers in the video and uh, that I use way less than is recommended on the bag. Uh, amazing, a fertilizer company wants to sell you more fertilizer than you probably need. Uh, let's see. Somebody got some deer damage on their um, little giant arborvita, or um, you know, this would apply to emerald arborvita and DeGroote's arborvita. It doesn't matter what it is. The deer will eat the bottom out of them, and they wanted to know um, if uh, they will recover. They'll take a long time to recover. I mean, the ones I see that are eaten out, you know, they've been eaten in a circle around them. Uh, they don't recover all that well, and one of the problems is you can't get light down through the plant to the bottom of it. Um, like if this loripedalum got thinned out down at the bottom and I didn't do any pruning off the top, how's it gonna get sunlight down in there to recover from that? Same problem on those arborvita. Maybe one side will get more sun and probably recover a little bit better, but the dark side of the plant may not recover all that well. Um, if you have deer, I do not recommend using emerald or arborvita or degroots or uh, little giant or any of them. Um, those uh, uh, North Pole Arborvita, any of them, De deer will do significant damage to those things and uh, it's, they're probably going to be super slow to recover. I hate to give people bad news, but I haven't seen one that was eaten like that um, come back out and look great again. Um, that's not to say it's not possible. You, can, you could probably do a little bit of shearing on the side of them and encourage them uh, to get, you know, give you a little bit more light down at the bottom of the plant. Just limited shearing. Uh, to hold back the top a little bit and fertilize them. Um, again, you know, you can do that anytime now. So somebody asked me about pruning uh, blueberries uh, and they had read a lot of different opinions about when and how and that kind of thing. I wanted to know what I thought about it. Um, this is the actual time to be pruning uh, blueberries, uh, late February, early March. Uh, and uh, the th that's the when. Uh, the how is uh, first you're going to select dead wood and cut, put, cut back anything that's obviously dead on the plant, um, you know, get, get rid of that. The second thing you're gonna look for is in, you wanna do some interior thinning on them. Uh, any branches that are heading back toward the middle of the plant or any branches that are rubbing on other branches, go ahead and get rid of that stuff, thin that stuff out for sure. And then thirdly, on older plants, we actually take the oldest um, wood all the way to the ground. And so you're gonna select out a certain amount of, uh, of canes uh, each year and get rid of them. Uh, the person who asked me this has newer planted blueberries that have been in containers for a couple years. I don't think you're at that point where you have that old, super old wood where you're gonna start selecting entire branches and cutting them all the way to the ground yet. That's gonna be on older plants. First year, um, new branches that come up, root suckers that come up on blueberries are not gonna fruit. They'll fruit the second, third, fourth, fifth year really well. After that, they start to slow down and give you lots of leaves, but not a lot of blueberries. So you leave the newest ones um, and the ones that are two, three, four years old, and the, the ones that are just really old and gnarly, you cut back to the ground um, 
once they are mature. But again, the person who asked me this question has newer planted plants in containers. I don't think you're gonna do any of that. Just get out the old wood and thin the middle of the plant some. Okay, that is the answer to that one. Okay, um, somebody asked me the best pot for growing strawberries and they have just strawberry containers you can get. And I just get terracotta um, strawberry containers and they have the eight spots on them. I'm sure you guys have seen these pots, but those strawberry planters. Um, and then you can plant something decorative in the top of the pot or another strawberry if you want to. But, um, and then I would use terracotta. They were concerned about whether their strawberries would be organic if they grew them in plastic pots. And I don't know, <laughs> but terracotta uh, strawberry pots should be available in garden centers this time of year and uh, would cover both the organic um, question and how to grow, you know, the best pot for growing strawberries. Okay, um, somebody asked about um, growing basil year round. Um, if you're growing Italian basil, it's an annual. And so, you know, it's, you know, in nature, that thing's gonna die in the winter and it seeds itself profusely and comes back the next year. I do know people try to bring them in and save them for a while, but for me, um, in nature, it's an act, it is an actual annual. It wants to come up, seed itself, and then die. And so um, uh, uh, I would just repurchase it every spring or do it from seed um, yourself. Um, but usually I can find a six pack of Italian basil every spring for you know $4 or something and uh, just replace it uh, each season. There are perennial basils as well. That African basil that I grow in this yard is perennial. And what I do with it to keep it alive is I take cuttings on it and I keep them inside through the winter and then replant them in the spring. But this is not a culinary basil. It's, I'm growing it for bees because uh, the pollinators absolutely love it, um, African basil. But the uh, Italian basil, I know some people do bring in and try to keep and try to keep it alive for a long time. But its natural life cycle is an, is an actual annual. And uh, uh, I would just treat it that way. Um, they're easy to do from seed or they're easy to find in the spring and buy in six packs, not in four inch cups. I don't, this new thing with every annual being in a four inch cup and super annoying to me, you know, $4 annuals. Um, I, I like to, uh, you know, especially non-patented, you know, annuals. I like to be able to find um, garden centers and places where I can buy these things in four packs and six packs. Um, they're going to grow like weeds all season. So no real reason to buy you know, four inch annuals. Somebody asked me how long it takes camellias uh, to root. They are pretty slow to root. If you take the cuttings in June, July, August, which is probably the best time of year to take them, six to eight weeks um, for us to see roots on them. Other things I can root and, you know, start getting roots in three days to eight days. Um, but camellias are definitely slower. I've got a tray of camellias on the back porch back here that I rooted last year. If you're trying to root them in the winter time, maybe not at all. Um, the best time of year to do them is uh, semi-hard wood in the summer, uh, about four or five leaves back. Camellias are super specific in the way you need to root them, um, but six or eight weeks in the summer. Okay, last question for this week. Um, somebody asked me if should they wait to prune their roses until it's a little bit drier. So they're obviously somewhere in my area and it's uh, rained a lot on them. I think well-established plants, I don't think it's gonna matter uh, when you prune them uh, all that much. Uh, if you, if you're, if you wanna wait till it's a little drier, you can, but um, they're gonna start waking back up pretty soon. So I think the sooner you do it, the better um, on established, well-established plants. If they're, you know, if they're newly planted plants, again, I always talk about that double stressing thing. Um, I talked about the plants in Texas who that were planted in November, you know, potentially are be are dead because we're just doubling down on the stress, you know, of being transplanted and then having the worst cold, you know, that you guys have seen, you know, record breaking cold. Same thing with if you're asking me whether or not you should do something to a plant that you just put in the ground, I'm probably going to say don't. Um, you know, start hacking away at it. But if it's a well-established plant, I don't think it's gonna matter how wet the soil is. Um, go ahead and get them pruned. Thank you guys for following along with these question and answer videos. Again, if you wanna send me some of those, a uh, few photos from um, Texas or Oklahoma, uh, maybe we can uh, diagnose some of those things. Thanks for watching.